Welcome everyone to the AVS Professional Development Webinar on Cultivate Your Leadership Skills, a Review of Effective Leadership Traits and Practices. Today's webinar will be led by Dr. Lily Wong, who is the Director of the Durham School of Architectural Engineering and Construction in the College of Engineering at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Lily is a former president and vice president of the Acoustical Society of America, as well as a fellow of ASA. Since being selected for the Big Ten Academic Alliance's Academic Leadership Program in 2013-2014, she has advanced in leadership roles and led numerous classes and professional development sessions on leadership, teamwork, and communication for faculty, student, and industry groups. We are delighted to have her present today on such a beneficial topic. Before we start, I'd like to go over, over a few items with you. If you have any questions during today's webinar, we encourage you to enter it in the chat box and Lily will do her best to address it during the webinar. There will also be a survey at the end, so please take a few moments to provide us with your feedback. And now I'd like to thank Lily for preparing and presenting today's webinar. Lily, if you're ready, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you so much, Angela, for the introduction and welcome everybody to today's presentation. Uh, I will now share my screen instead. Um, I'm very excited to be here to talk to you all about cultivating leadership skills, a review of effective leadership traits and practices. As Angela said, I um, have been really doing a lot of self-study on this topic over the past decade. And I am very excited to be here talking with you about it. But I will also say, I looked at many of the questions that some of you submitted as you registered. And I'll just say now that I'm not, um, you know, I can't answer everything and I don't have a wand that I can wave that will make everybody's um, leadership practices easier. But I'm hoping that today will at least help you on your leadership journey. So I thought we would start by discussing what, um, who, what, when, where, when, all those things about, um, about leadership. So who, what are leaders? Do you have to have a title to be a leader? No, you do not. Anybody who is any position can be a leader in different ways in your personal and your professional lives. And uh, so I don't want you to think that you have to be a leader, that this is a goal that you're reaching for, that you're going to become the department chair, you're going to become the division manager. And then that is actually why you're cultivating leadership skills. No, no matter what position you might have right now, you already can be practicing these and having an impact in your lives and the lives of those around you. So anybody can do it. But then what is leadership? Like, what do leaders do? And my favorite quote about what leaders do. Oh, uh, thank Lily, you. We're only seeing this. <laughs> thank you. I shared the wrong screen, apparently. Thank you for letting me know that. My apologies about that. There we go. Thank you, Jessica. <laughs> now everybody sees the screen, yes? Yes, we do. Okay, thank you. My apologies for that. All right, so we didn't miss much. All we were at was the, the, the title slide and then just starting with um, leaders. Who, what, when, where, why? So who is anyone? And my favorite quote now about what leaders do is, is this one from um, David Foster Wallace who wrote it in a Rolling Stone article. A real leader is somebody who can help us to overcome the limitations of our own individual laziness, our selfishness, our weakness, our fears, and get us to do better things than we can get ourselves to do on our own. I actually learned of this quote from a Harvard Business Review video, which I'll share a link with you at the end of today's um, session. And I, I feel like it is a it is a consummate description of what leaders do. And there's two parts there, right? Like one is that there are followers. If you're going to be a leader, there are people that are doing more because of how you're working with them. So people and interpersonal relations are going to be at the core of how we can cultivate better leadership skills. And I love also that it's, it's why there's a sort of hidden part there that like 
of getting at the why we do this, which is that we can do more when we have a leader that can help us to accomplish things in our organizations, in our families, in our various um, hobby groups and stuff like that. So I really like this definition. So who, any of you can be a leader. What would that mean? That means you're helping some others, groups of people to overcome their limitations and get that group to do more, better things. So then we could say, when, where, why, how, when, where, that one's the easy one. Anytime, anywhere we can use leaders. But today, yes, over the next um, 50 minutes, we're gonna talk about why and how. I actually wanna flip those and talk about the hows first, right? That's what we're doing is um, a review of best practices and how you can grow in your leadership skills. And then we'll come back to the why again at the end of, of the, um, the presentation. So there we are. We're talk about how today and then why. So I wanna take a minute and have you all think about ineffective leaders. Let's talk about the negative part first. So think of an ineffective leader with whom you've interacted. What was it that they did? The characteristics, their traits, that behavior, actual, the actual actions that they exhibited that made them ineffective. Just think about it. You can jot it down on a piece of paper if you like. We are gonna share it in just a moment in the chat. So just take a moment, bad leaders. I think we've all had at least some experiences with persons who were asked to lead something and they did not do it as effectively as they could. I'll give you a few seconds for that. And now reflect a bit and let's do the opposite. So now think of an effective leader, somebody that you admire. You could even be, and, and wait later, if you feel comfortable sharing, they are, that's great, because we will share by chat again, but maybe think of their position, like, is it a coach? Is, is it a boss? Is it um, somebody that you, a friend? What were the characteristics, traits, and behaviors that they exhibited that, may, that you feel makes them, make them effective? Take a few seconds. Like I said, jot it down if you can. Reflect on that. And now we're going to share. So I'm a professor at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, and think pair share is often a ta tactic that we use where we ask the students to think about it, as I just asked you. And then normally we would pair you up so you could like talk about it, but we don't have a lot of time to do it. So we're just going to, to share it all together. So let's hear, like, you'll use the chat function if you make sure you're chatting to everyone. And um, if you wouldn't mind sharing, what were some of the not admirable traits that you thought of when you were thinking of the ineffective leaders that you know? And I will also share some of mine at the end of this. Thank you, Giorgio, for getting us off on no accountability. They put other people down, indecisive. They won't listen. These are good. Lack of communication, they're not open to just that sort of the discussion side, demanding unreasonable expectations. Oh, I like that one. Well, I, mean, I don't like, want to take credit for everything. The ethics are at, at fault. Disorganized, taking credit for other people's work. Excellent. And we're going to save this chat. And, um, and I bet if I had saved it and I could have like taken your input, I'm hoping that today's um, talk will will help you to try to avoid many of these things you know that you should avoid being selfish and decisive you should not take credit for others work things like that so thank you for sharing those two that i often think about and i believe that um that some of you may have added this like uh this is a phrase that we hear in the leadership um readings about inauthentic leadership, that they're, it just feels like they are not being them true selves, they intre their integrities at, um, in doubt. And then the other one I feel like is that the, I feel like somebody maybe talked about this one too, that they don't listen to feedback. They don't listen period, but they, they don't even like try to take that feedback in and improve, improve their leadership. So 
Thank you for sharing those. Let's go the opposite way now. And what were the admirable, if you're willing to share, um, you know, a leader that you admire, that's fine. Or if you just want to type in the chat, what were the traits, the characteristics, the behaviors about those leaders that you greatly admired? Challenging people to be better, perform better. Yeah, and that was at the core of that definition by David Foster Wallace. They're engaging. They give you guidance, but freedom at the same time. Good listening. Yes, and that's certainly a counterpart to some of the chat inputs from the um, inefficient leaders, ineffective leaders. They recognize the contributions of others on their teams, kind, far-sighted and fair. These are good. Thank you very much for that. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna try to move my chat button here a little bit. Supportive. They help you grow. These are great. So these are the, in a way, the skills that we want you to be cultivating as you are growing your leadership skills. Elevate, empower, motivate. This is good. So how do we do those things? You know, how do we become better communicators, better listeners, better empowerers, calmer, more supportive, helping people grow. That's what I'm hoping that this session will, will help you to start with. In my opinion, the foundation of all a lot of the things that you all are talking about, when we look at the admirable traits, the foundation is what we call emotional intelligence. This comes from a very classic article from the Harvard Business Review. Uh, by Daniel Goleman, it's um, if dated even from 1998, but of what makes a leader. I highly recommend this article. And I have taken some slides from a presentation that Harvard Business Review makes possible so that you can understand, because this is the foundation. And on top of that, I'm going to share some of the skill sets that I think we can develop. But the foundation of it all is, uh, oh, thank you, yes. Thank you, Kathy, for noticing that. So can you not change it to everyone? Um, so what we're saying is that it, the participants can only chat to hosts and panelists, not to everybody. Okay, my apologies for that, that we didn't have it set up so that you could um, see all the chat. I don't know if one of our um, tech support persons can maybe change that option for the participants, but if so, that would be much appreciated. Um, yes, because normally uh, it, it should have been possible that you could actually chat, chat to everybody. So my apologies for that. Okay, the foundation, we'll see if we can get that change, is emotional intelligence. And what is emotional intelligence? It is... Uh, According to Goleman's article, twice, twice as important as having the appropriate technical skills or being the smartest person in the room, that being able to define these um, would, be, would be better, being able to have emotional intelligence. So there are five components to emotional intelligence that Goleman outlined, and they are here. Number one being self-awareness. Number two, self-regulation three, that you have motivation, four, that you have empathy, and five, social skill. And I'm just going to touch on each of those briefly because this is already something that each of us can be developing and is the core on top of these other skills that I'm going to be talking about today. So self-awareness, in my opinion, is maybe the most key. It's where you are realistically assessing yourself. People say that leaders who also have self-awareness seem to not take themselves as seriously. They have a self-deprecating sense of humor and they do have a confidence. So it's not a self-awareness where you're doubting yourself all the time, but it's sort of being comfortable in your own skin. So there's that part, knowing your strengths, but also being aware of, of parts of you that you could be working on and developing. Leaders see themselves clearly, then they would also see the people that they work with and the companies and the programs and um, the groups that they work with clearly. Two, the second one was self-regulation. And this is maybe, you know, holding back on sometimes the, the bite, biting comment that you would like to give to the person who has bugged you about the same thing over and over again, that you self-regulate 
and you be thoughtful about it, you, you hold yourself up with in integrity, and also that you're comfortable with the fact that things are gray. Because when you're a leader, there's not always going to be a right answer and a wrong answer. There's just different answers. And so there is ambiguity there. And that to be able to be comfortable with that, that's a self-regulation component. Leaders who control their feelings are ones that create an atmosphere of fairness and trust. This can be hard. We'll come back to the hardness of leadership later. Three, motivation. You're passionate for it. You want to raise the bar. You're committed. You're optimistic. This is an important component of um, that emotional intelligence. Because if you are that way, then this is contagious to the rest of the group that you are working with to make them want to leave behind that laziness, selfishness, weakness, fear, remember, so that we can all do better together. Four is empathy. I'm sure you heard of this one. I even think that this was something that people have typed in the chat, although I'm sorry that you did not see that <laughs> at the beginning, but we can make sure to share that with all of you later. It's the ability to read between the lines and having skill with groups and being able to read body language, understanding the, um, the underlying tensions that might be happening in a group. So leaders who do manage with empathy, they Harvard Business Review's um, article talks about how they had increased satisfaction and reduced turnover in those companies that they studied. And finally, social skill that you are able to work with teams, uh, have some gifts at persuasion, at collaboration. This next slide I thought was kind of interesting that schmoozing can be a good thing because sometimes schmoozing is actually this component of social skills and building relationships. So just coming back to those five components again, self-awareness, regulating yourself, having that motivation, empathy, and social skills. Those are the core foundational parts of having emotional intelligence. And I do highly recommend that Goleman article to um, read in more depth about all of those. But now that we have that, and you can learn it, so um, don't feel that it's an innate trait, a core component of that our business review article is that we can learn this and develop these skills. So you're developing that. And then on top of that, I wanted to share with you three other core skills that I have found myself to be helpful and that I'm hoping will help you all too as you grow in your leadership skills. So one is working with teams. If you, if I looked through the chat, you know, many of you uh, talked about how it is important to, Yvonne, you mentioned elevate, empower, and motivate their team. Um, recognizing contributions of others on their team is something that Ed shared. Um, so empowering individuals David, thanks for that. But you know, there's clearly a group of people that we're working with. And so maybe it's an informal team, a formal team, but how do we do that better to make sure that we are accomplishing what leaders do? And then I will delve into these two other skills which build on that. We have to have difficult conversations. How do we do that more effectively? And then one of those difficult conversations Thank you, Angela. Angela's just commenting that it should be that everybody now can see the chat feature. So thank you for setting that up. Um, another um, difficult tech kind of conversation that I think that I have really had to develop over um, my leadership journey is how to give and how to receive feedback well. So we'll talk about each of these three. Okay, so let's start with teams. I am going to refer to a lot of books. I, I have done most of my leadership training. Um, well, I, I, as Angela mentioned, I did participate over a decade ago in a training session for academic leaders. And that began my journey of reflecting and thinking about how I could build on these skills. And over that, those past, I think that was 2013, so it was 10 years ago, I have been accumulating a library of favorite books. And so I am going to be pulling from those favorite books. So my first favorite book has to do with working on teams and it is our core skill number one. And it is Patrick Lencioni's. And I know I have this, like, it's not gonna like work because I was like in front of myself. Um, Patrick Lencioni's Five Dysfunctions of a Team, a Leadership Fable. Written really well as a story, very easy to, um, to digest. And 
I can really, in some ways, only give you the the beginnings of, of all of these things. And I highly encourage that you would also consider reading these or listening to these books. So the summary of working with teams is that this is these are the the most harmful things that happen and why, in a way, leadership wouldn't work. There is at the base an absence of trust. And then on top of that, there is fear of conflict. That's going to be our communications piece because there's maybe ambiguity and also we don't trust or uh, have have conflict in, inducing conversations that can be good for our group. There's lack of commitment, which then means that there's maybe low standards. We're avoiding accountability. And at the top of it, there's um, inattention to results. And on the side, you're just seeing that as the leader, this is because you're feeling invulnerable. And so people don't trust you. You're causing artificial harmony, just saying, oh, everything's great. But really, you're just sweeping all the problems under the rug. The, the goal of whatever we're trying to accomplish is ambiguous. I'm not holding high standards or have accountability, mostly because, again, this is fear of conflict, perhaps. And it's all about me. Some of you talked about that, that the ineffective leaders made it a lot about themselves. Okay, maybe not looking at it from the negative viewpoint. Let's look at it from the positive side, right? We, when we work with these teams as leaders, we want people to trust one another, that we can count on each other. They should have conflict, unfiltered conflict around ideas, not judging people, but actually the work that we're doing. We should have conflict about that, productive conflict. Then as a group, we should commit to the decisions, commit to the actions we want to take, hold each other accountable, and focus on the achievement of results. So this is one that I think about often because I am a department chair right now at the University of Nebraska in the College of Engineering. I have a leadership team. I oversee three academic degrees and I have six people, six faculty on my leadership team. And it is something that I think about, you know, are they trusting me? Are they afraid to bring up questions that might cause conflict? Do we have clarity when they don't, when we don't accomplish something or they don't accomplish something, how do we hold each other accountable? And am I making sure that it's not all about me and how perfect my leadership is, but are we achieving the results that we want? Remember that definition, going back to that definition of leader, that we are able to do more altogether than maybe just one person could have. And two things that I always like to highlight, oh, it is very hard sometimes when I'm in this leadership team meetings to avoid group think. We have a powerful desire to all have consensus, to be hunky-dory, kumbaya. And you, when you're leading, be very wary of that. You're not a good leader if all of a sudden everybody agrees and it, there was like, oh, that was so simple. That is the propensity of us in a group to want to like follow the herd and be agreeable and not be seen as a person that causes conflict. But that is actually not how we should lead teams. So um, one of the things that some of the other teamwork, um, lead, teamwork readings talk about is that it's actually good when you have like a, a deliberate team like I have, a leadership team like I have, that I do designate one of them to deliberately be the deviant. <laughs> some, 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 some readings call it a deviant, some call it a minor of conflict, M-I-N-E-R, that somebody is there to prevent us from doing that, to be like, oh, wait, it's in a way normalizing this conflict, right? To say like, okay, let's stop. We all, it seems like we're all thinking this, but let's stop. Is it true? Like, have we actually thought about all the diverse opinions in this group? So be very aware of that group think is one thing that I found helpful. And the other thing that I have found helpful as I work with teams is people always want to say, oh, we've already spent so much time, so much money, so much effort on this. And they don't want to stop on an effort that maybe is already just a bad decision. So that's another one is to be aware, beware of sunk costs when you're leading a team to that. Don't don't be mirrored by the by that um, by wanting to to keep going because you've already spent so much money. It's better to, in a way to 
cut there. Okay, so I can only give each of these core skills a few minutes, I'm sorry, but this one, this one is um, one that I think is good. And because there's this communication piece, people fear conflict. And in some of the questions that some of you turned in before this session, you asked about the communication conflict, how do you have these difficult conversations? The one, the core skill number two, then digging dip a little deeper or maybe higher on the pyramid is having difficult conversations. So my favorite book on, there's a couple, but the one I'm going to talk about today is Crucial Conversations. And um, I believed in this so much that I actually became a certified instructor for Crucial Conversations. And I have all the members of my leadership team work on this with me. And I feel like it has really changed how we can have and hold difficult conversations. At the core of this model is saying that people don't have difficult conversations because they feel like they're making a choice that they're going to be kind. I'm not going to tell Lily what I really think about her idea. She's the boss, first of all, so I'm not going to tell her because I'm scared of that, but also because I think I want to be kind. So I'm not going to be honest. I'm going to be kind. But the heart of this model is saying that's false. That is a we, that is a false choice that many of us choose to make. And yes, of course, you get uncomfortable maybe having this difficult conversation, but these this is a skill set you can learn, and I have found it very helpful. This graphic is a snapshot of it, and I can't go into this whole training. Crucial conversation training is about um, 12 hours, and we could certainly, if some of you are interested, you know, talk about maybe having such a workshop, um, but I did want to highlight two things that I feel like are the strongest takeaways about having difficult conversations. And that's true whether you go through this crucial conversations model or one of my other books is Nonverbal Communication by Marshall Rosenberg. And the same concepts are in there, but I'm going to use the crucial conversations model for you right now. So it has these steps of how you hold it and it basically helps you to frame it so that you can hold your emotions at bay. I stepped into the department chair position two years ago here at the University of Nebraska. And one reason I had avoided that position was because I knew I had to have annual evaluations with tenured faculty who are colleagues that I've been colleagues with for decades. And some of those are going to be difficult. And this skill, this framework has really helped me to work through those conversations to calm my fast beating heart when I'm really feeling distressed and in conflict with some of the people. So I highly encourage all of you to get the book to maybe take a training, but I'm gonna just say that the, the process of learning it is a framework. And the first part is you get unstuck, you think about why you should have this conversation. Then there's a step called master your stories. So this is before, before you have this conversation, you'd have to get unstuck, master your stories. Then there's a part where you think about what you want, start with heart, state your path, then think about what they're thinking about. And in the end, you have an action. Okay, that's like 12 and a half hours of training and a one minute summary. But to make this a little clearer, I'm gonna focus on two of the core components that I think are really important for everyone who is wanting to develop leaderships. So one is mastering stories. So first to master your stories, you have to understand why that when you when somebody does something that there's a path to that action that's being taken. So you see and hear something. When you see and hear that, you are telling yourself a story in your head. That story makes you feel a certain way. And then once you feel that way, you act out on it. And so as a leader, what's important to me is actually this part right here. We have to be very careful about the stories that we are telling and be aware of the stories that other people have in their heads. So I'm going to leave this, um, sorry, let me just try to get out of this and go to a different, uh, this is actually from the Crucial Conversations model. I wanna make sure that everybody can see that we have, we're about to watch a video and this video shows Chen. Chen is a manager 
And um, I'm just going to have you, the video will tell you, like he sees and hears things that makes him come up with a story, which makes him feel something and he's going to take an action. So this is what we're, we're watching for each of those elements. And then what happens? He's a leader. What happens when he acts out on his story? Right? So this is what we're watching. I'm hoping you can, you should have shared the sound, but if I didn't made a mistake there, then somebody please chat me, but here we go. So let's take a look. Hey, heads up, Taylor's on his way over here and he's got some pretty bad news. The project we've been working on for the last two weeks was sent to London, Ontario, Canada, not London, England. So the client's obviously pretty upset and they're threatening to sue us. So. How did this happen? the first step. I guess we'll find out when he gets here. Here's his story. You know what? I do know what happened. He must have done what I told him not to do. He was trying to get off early that day and trying to get to his kid's baseball game. And then he wanted to turn the job over to Vanya. And she's only been here for only a week. And I told him not to. And then later on, you see him getting in his car. You know, I must have bit him. He blatantly ignored my directions. Here's his feeling. He's feeling pretty mad. So how's the big job? Uh, yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Seems the package got sent to Canada and not England. Do you know what the big issue is? Here's him acting. <laughs> you think that you're always the smartest person in the room. I told you exactly what to do, exactly. And then you rush your way through it, putting the whole company at risk. And then you come here thinking that uh, I'm just gonna let it go. Well, you come to the wrong place because I'm fresh out of sympathy this time. Well, actually I did what you directed, exactly. But when I sent the routing slip up through your office for final approval, someone entered the wrong shipping code. Well, I mean, that, that, that does happen. Um, okay, uh, good job. Uh, I'll just take it from here, and uh, thanks for the update. So when you were thinking about ineffective leaders before, had you considered something like, have you had a leader that maybe acted like that? And, and what we're trying to get is that that's that path of action. We do it but also other people do it too. They're, they see and hear things. We have such a quick tendency to tell ourselves a story about what we saw and heard. That story makes us feel an emotion. In this case, Chen was so upset because he was certain that that person had disobeyed him and not done what, um, what Chen had asked. But in truth, and then he the acts out, he has this terrible moment with, with the employee, and it turns out that he was wrong. So when I am, um, yes, thank you. That's exactly right, David. Like, make sure you get both sides paused for it. And another key part is this, what we see here on the screen. This one tool alone, I think, is a really powerful one of all the ones that they talk about in the Crucial Conversations framework. Separating facts from stories. So this is an example they have in that training that, they have a story, you watch a video about a person who's angry like Chen was, and then you are asked to say, you know, tell me some facts about what you saw. And these are common facts. People say, oh, he was angry. He was accusatory. He was aggressive. He invaded the other person's personal space. He stormed to the room. He stood while Charon sat. The fact is that only one of these bullets is a fact. The rest of the, them are stories. And the way we differentiate that is facts are observable actions, incontrovertible things that you see or you heard, not what you think you saw, what you think you heard. Stories are when you tie judgments to them. And so many, many, many of these already have a judgment tied to them. And this is one of those things that I, it, and the action itself could actually tell a, a hundred thousand different stories. And you've picked one of them, maybe one that's very common, but it may not be the accurate one. So in the chat, does anybody, can anybody tell me which one is the fact of these six? Like, you know, that you haven't seen the, you haven't seen the video, 
But when you look at these statements that you might, you know, like this person's angry, this person's accusatory, which one is, yes, thank you, Kathy. The very last one is the only one of these that is a fact. And so whenever you're starting to get emotional as a leader, you know, or, or even as a team member or other team members are doing that, think about this particular skill that go back and think, okay, what is it that I actually saw that happened? I just told myself a story that he's a jerk or he doesn't respect me or whatever the things are as a leader that might be making it difficult for you to hold, for you to self-regulate. Remember that emotional intelligent core of that foundation and go back and be careful of the story that you're telling yourself. You have to separate them. And another key thing that they talk about in that training is that there are three very common ones that we tell ourselves. Oftentimes we say, it's not my fault. And so uh, this is what they call the victim story. There's another very common one, which is it's that person's fault, which is in a way what Chen was falling into, right? That the employee messed up. They were, they were bad. They didn't do what I told them to do. The third one is that there's nothing I can do. And so you, you keep having the same conflict perhaps. So that's a flavor of one of the, uh, of holding difficult conversations and growing that skill. And one of the most important ones I really want you to hear, which is be very careful whenever you are leading and want to grow your skills to be separating that and careful of your stories because they can make you act in a certain way, lead in a certain way, and you need to take a pause just like you're saying, and, and think about it. Okay, the other one I was hoping to have some time for is about making it safe. So this is more on how to actually have the difficult conversation. And, um, and so I'm going to, I'm gonna try to go ahead and take the time to um, watch this video as well. So we'll watch this one. We're watching Jose and Alvaro, they are peers and rivals. They're competing for the same projects. They're both working hard for the next big promotion. Alvaro thinks that Josh has been undermining him for months. And so Josh is going to come and share some feedback with Alvaro. But if you were Alvaro, how safe would you feel? So let's watch this. Hey, Alvaro. Hey, oh. Josh. I uh, heard about you struggling at the budget meeting. What do you mean? I think I know what's causing some of the problem. I'd be happy to share some ideas. I think that would really help. So this was Alvaro, this is Josh. And if you were Alvaro, and this, this is a rival of yours, and you're both Josh, you know, trying to for this promotion, how would you feel about um, Josh coming to say that he's got some feedback for you? And if you, you could type that in the chat, I believe. Oh, okay, so you may still have to, Make sure you're choosing that you're chatting to everyone, because I think now I can see some of you are chatting to everyone, but some of you are still chatting to hosts and panelists. But the question is, how does this make you feel if your rival? Okay, good. Hey, you're going to hear them out. Excellent. Is anybody else feeling cautious? Thank you, Tim. Wary, suspicious. Yes, Jessica. And what I'm getting at here is that it's actually the story, right? What is the story that Alvaro has about Josh? So he sees and hears that Josh wants to give him feedback. And then it's the story. Is it because, oh, he wants to one up me. He wants to make me feel not so great. And then you're going to feel maybe a little bit more defensive and like you said, suspicious, maybe a little angry, getting ready for all that. But what's interesting is what if we had flipped it and said, Josh is your friend? Like, what if he's like your best friend in the company? Then if that person comes and wants to give you feedback, do you see how that story changes? Now this is a person who's trying to help you and give you like help your, your goals and wishes. So when we talk about making it safe, the, the whole point of that part of difficult conversations training is to be aware that people might have a story in their head of why you're having, you know, why you're communicating the way you are to them. And so 
making sure to make sure that they feel safe, that they might perceive you as Josh the friend rather than Josh the rival will go a long way to how they um, take that story. So that's the other part. Those are the only two I can really go through today. If you don't make it safe, if they feel unsafe, there are two common ways of reacting. One, they go to silence. They don't say anything, they ignore it. They just don't even address it because there's a fear of conflict or they become overly aggressive. In my family, it was traditional that we would go to silence. That's how I grew up. If there was anybody who you know, like got started getting upset, we just wouldn't talk about it. As a matter of fact, I share the story that in my early 30s, my brother, who is two years younger than me, didn't talk to me for two years because of a game we played at Thanksgiving that triggered him to say that he thinks I'm bossy and controlling, things like that. And so that's a very, he felt unsafe. He went to silence. And we were not at that time practiced in holding difficult conversations. So this is not only like applicable to your work um, environments, but also your home personal environments too. As I said, I'm sorry that I can't go through more of crucial conversations, but that is a second skill that I feel like we need to build. So having the core foundation of emotional intelligence, then thinking about how we're working with groups of people, because that's what leaders do, and what are the common traps of, we, of teamwork. Often part of that is being able to have these difficult conversations, so developing those skills. And then the third one is even more about communications, that it's about feedback. How do we give and receive feedback? I love this book that you see on there by Stone and Heen. Thanks for the feedback. Science and art of receiving feedback well. And here are some of the four points from this leadership um, skill that I think are important. Because when you're a leader, if you're a named, like in a title, you likely are being asked to formally give feedback. But even if you're in an informal group, maybe you need, to, like you need to hold the others on your team accountable. So there is having to give feedback there. One of the things I learned from this book was that there are actually three different kinds of feedback. And sometimes when we're having feedback conversations, the problem with the feedback conversation is that the person giving the feedback has one of these types in mind, but the person receiving the feedback is thinking or expecting something else. So one of the types is just appreciation. Maybe sometimes you just simply want feedback to say that you're doing a good job. Good job wonderful, really appreciate all you do. And there's certainly um, the story that the book talks about at the beginning is a father of twin girls and he's coaching them softball and he's giving them the second type of feedback coaching, which, you know, maybe pointers on how to be better at softball. But one of the daughters is taking it well because she is expecting coaching to improve her softball skills. But the other daughter isn't because she really just wants appreciation. She just wants to hear how good she is doing. And so part of giving and receiving feedback more effectively is just already making clear, what kind of feedback are you expecting? And am I giving that to you as you expect? So I think you understand appreciation. Coaching, as I was just saying, is in a way what we'd call formative. How do you help somebody to be better? In that scenario we just saw with Joshua and Alvaro, you know, maybe it's if they were friends, right? Then Joshua might be giving him some coaching advice. He's not just going to give appreciation and be like, oh yeah, you did a good job in that team meeting presenting your ideas. But maybe he's, you know, maybe he knows that Alvaro wants to advance. And so he's like, okay, I've got some coaching for you. You know that I'm doing coaching right now, right? Not appreciation. Evaluation is what we would call the summative feedback, right? So maybe this is the once a year when I'm meeting with all my faculty and I have to give them an overall summative evaluation of how things went. And then that is more of a formal evaluation. The book actually talks about how the best annual evaluation meetings or quarterly evaluation meetings or however often you might have evaluation meetings with people you lead or the person who leads you, who manages you, let's say, um, it's often good to separate these because sometimes when you hear your summative, it can be hard to listen to the coaching things. But this was already one concept from this book that I thought was very helpful as um, we grow in our leadership skills. 
Another thing that I think is very important here is has to be specific. I just got feedback three days ago uh, about, um, and this was something that I think somebody brought this up as a question that I do not see there, there are some people on my on my department. I have 30 people in my department, my academic department, some people who feel like I don't trust them. And that so that was a feedback. Now, that feedback is actually hard for me to use because it's not specific enough. So I did try to push when I having, was having this conversation with the person I asked, like, can you give me a more specific example of the actual action, right? Going back to that crucial conversation framework, what was it that they saw or heard me do that they are interpreting it as me not trusting them? So having more specific feedback and asking for more specific feedback is going to help us become better leaders. Two more things from the feedback book that I love. One thing is that when I get feedback, it's always hard, right? We know it, we've all gotten feedback. It's hard because I always want to point out what's wrong with their feedback. So for that example, you're not trusting people, Lily. And in my head, I am wrong spotting. I see the data differently. I have a different interpretation. I'm like, oh my gosh, I am trusting um, Michelle to do that, Brandon to do that, uh, Terry to do that. How am I not trusting people? That's why I need the specific example because otherwise I'm sitting there trying to think like, oh, I can't trust it. This is bad feedback because I can see everything that's wrong with it. But what we really should be doing is looking for the differences, be curious, stay open. This is that, you know, um, again, on that emotional intelligence foundation, tell me more. What is it that, you know, give me more details so that I can understand why you hear the story or see the story differently from how I've been um, interpreting the story. One more from this book. We all have blind spots. And this is why getting feedback is really important, why I was actually asking for it from my team. Um, and I think because of time, I'm not going to go through these three very common amplifications in great detail, but there's an impact of emotion. There's an impact of how we think of it as internal or external. When it's feedback to myself of something I'm doing wrong, I tend to say that's external. It's the situation's fault. But then when we're, others are giving feedback, they tend to think it's internal to me, that it's my character. And another one that's very common is intention. What's my intent, but that's the impact that it's having on others. So another great book that I would definitely recommend. So those three skill sets, building on top of emotional intelligence, working with teams, having difficult conversations, and then even more specifically, this one to make sure that we're holding people accountable and doing better to be able to give and receive feedback. Okay, so in these final moments, I wanna talk about the fact that leadership is hard. It's not easy. I like this quote from an article that came out in the Harvard Business Review just this past year. Leaders are expected to attend to employees' mental and physical health and burnout, also addressing their own. They have to demonstrate bottomless sensitivity and compassion because we are, growing that foundation of emotional intelligence, right? These days, providing opportunities for flexibility and remote work. And all of this, while we're managing the bottom line, we're trying to do more with less these days, and we're overcoming challenges with hiring and retaining talent. It is hard. And I have certainly, in the two years that I've been department chair, this, I was so happy when I read this article, because this, this, in a way, was like calming to me, or at least to say like, yes, this is hard, but you know, having to deal with all this because people don't come back often with the feedback that you're doing great. They're not showing the appreciation, right? They have so many ways to coach and evaluate you. And you, you know, from my standpoint of what I hear and, and see and how I tell the story, I'm doing, I'm trying to do the best I can. So this is just to recognize it's hard. One of the books, um, what another quote that I like. Uh, it comes from Theodore Roosevelt. Some of you might be aware of this because it was in Brene Brown's book, which is my next book that I have here that I love, Dare to Lead. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man is stumbling or how the person doing, how the leader could have done better. It, the credit does belong to those who are in the arena, 
Their face is marred by dust, sweat, blood. We're striving valiantly, erring, coming up short. But there's no effort without error or coming. But the why in the end is that we know the great enthusiasm, the great devotions. At the best, we have the triumph of high achievement. And at the worst, at least we failed while daring greatly. So this quote is attributed to Teddy Roosevelt. And as I said, um, this one really called to me and is a core, core component of Brene Brown's great book, Dare to Lead, which I think does talk about this, how it's hard and how it is very easy to, to revert to some of the practices of ineffective leaders, the ones that some of you shared at the beginning um, that unfortunately not everybody could see. But um, So to counter that, right, it's hard. I still think that the best thing to, to be work to help with that is to keep building on our emotional intelligence um, foundation that it's really about self-reflection. So thinking about what do I naturally do? Focus time and energy on developing those. And just a quick plug that if you haven't done this before, one of the ways I started was um, a book called Strengths-Based Leadership. Clifton Strengths 2.0. There are, I think, 32 of them. And you can read the book. It tells you all about these strengths that um, is, is basically run at Gallup. That uh, company studied this and Clifton was the person. He was actually a faculty member at the University of Nebraska developing many of these. And you can look at what your natural skills are. So this is part of that reflection and growing your emotional intelligence. And I will just share that these happen to be mine and that strengths have the also ability to be weaknesses. And so what's great about this reflection is understanding that, for example, harmony, I am a positive person and I want people to get along, but I have to be careful of not going to that group think, right? That, oh, let's just all get along. And so understanding your strengths, but also understanding how they can become weaknesses is a great thing to do. So that's one other task that I would recommend all of you um, do is to maybe consider getting a study or analysis of your Clifton strengths. And then somebody even asked this in the feet on the when you registered, it's difficult to get good feedback. I'm the department chair, I'm asking for feedback. That person, when he, when he said to me, oh, there are some people who don't trust you, and I asked him to be more specific, he still would not do it because I have the department chair title. So there's what a fear of retribution. Maybe he doesn't want to hurt my feelings. What I would say is that it can be hard as you rise up in leadership to get honest feedback to become a better leader. And then I also wanted to say that it can also still be hard to receive, right? It's still hard to hear how you're not being a good leader, which is why I was saying that you have to be careful about wrong spotting. Think about being open-minded. What is it about their story that's different from my story? And I believe that that number one, self-awareness is still at the core, reflect regularly. So what went well, what didn't, and look for trusted contacts. Last comment, don't be afraid to fail because it does happen. I have certainly, in the as I've grown in leadership, had some failures. I was president of the Acoustical Society of America, and there was one executive committee meeting that went completely badly. <laughs> but we use those as opportunities to learn. So these references are in my slides, which I will share with Angela and allow people to, you know, they're hyperlinked. Um, this is that video where they talk about that quote. And I will be happy now to take questions. If you would like to type them into the chat box, we can certainly answer them that way. Or I'm also happy to look back at um, the list of questions that some of you submitted upon registration. So does anybody want to ask a question at this moment? Let me look up my. Sorry. All right, Lily, I have a question. Do you have any tips for a new manager or a leader on how to, how to delegate work and responsibilities? Was that one of the questions that was? Yes. Um, yes. How to delegate. Um, 
yeah, there was a tip for me. Yes. And also how to, how to tell people what to do. Cause it's somebody else had this, it's more easy to do things by myself than to ask others to do it. So delegating. So I think that having like, those better communication skills is core to that so that it doesn't come across as, you know, being domineering or bossy, but, you know, building trust and then being able to say, okay, how, you know, how are people's loads doing and how having more open communication to understand who can take it or not. Now, I will tell you that I still struggle with this because um, one of the things that I find is that the people that you delegate to are not going to maybe do it exactly the same way that you would do it, right? So maybe you would have done it differently or maybe you would have done it in your mind better. But that is something that we have to struggle with that as we grow in leadership skills, we accomplish more all together than we can singly. And so if you do want to become a more effective leader, it is practicing how to continue, not saying that I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it, but to have good, helpful conversations with others and be able to delegate that task. But it is a, a difficult, a difficult part. Another, um, Another question that came in through the, um, the questions ahead of time was tips on time and project management. So we didn't really have time to do that because in a way I was talking about some of these skills that are more based on interpersonal reactions or interpersonal relationships with people. But when you talk about organizational skills, there are things you can learn in that realm as well. And I, uh, I do find I just went through actually a training called Getting Things Done. And um, it's a book by David Allen, but the, they also offer training on it. And I do think it is diligence to, um, so there, there are frameworks out there of how to stay organized and how to clear your brain so that you aren't feeling overload and stressed. And so I do recommend that you look at the Getting Things Done framework. Um, and then another one that, just came out last year, I think is called 4,000 Hours. It's on my reading list. I actually haven't read that one yet, but I, thank you, Ed, for your question. You're chair of a town function, the town manager you like, but he thinks he should be in this particular situation, my agent. He's accused me of ignoring his direction. Thank you, Ed. I think, so, do I, if you can explain to me, like, does that, does the, you're the chair and that person's the manager. So, so in a way, is the manager supposed to be deferring to you? I'm going to assume that that's what it is, that you are actually in the top position. And my, my dean, I actually just had this leadership conversation with him about that feedback I got about trust. And he actually said that oftentimes he finds that when they say they're not trusting us, it's because we didn't do what they wanted. So in this case, that your town manager, you're the one maybe who gets to make the final decision, but your town manager feels like you're making the wrong decisions because you're not listening and, and um, you know thinking about his directions. And that that is hard because they interpret that to mean that you don't trust them or something. And so it is a, I, I, I feel like, he, Medine and I were discussing that that is a problem because we, there is in that case, in our case, maybe in your case too, as the chair, we have a position where we do have a title, we do have a, a job and we can't make everybody happy. And so it, what we can best do, which comes from that Lencioni book is make sure everybody feels heard at least. Does everybody feel heard? Does this manager feel heard, not just by you, but maybe by other people who are also working on a committee with you? And could it have been that, would there have been time in a committee meeting that those, that manager's ideas could have been put into the pool and considered? And then everybody maybe generally talk through it and come to the consensus that supports the direction you went? Or if not, if you have the title to be able to make the final decision, then at least you could say, well, I've heard all of you, what you've had to say, but this is going to be my decision of how we're going. I hope that wasn't too vague, but that's how I've felt about it sometimes when we are, when we have people who are 
feeling distrustful or not, not um, thinking that we're thinking what they want. Any thoughts on the importance of a leader knowing when to give up on a problem employee? Oh, <laughs> I have a, one of those problem employees myself. Um, so I think it depends on your situation. One thing I've learned in academia is that sometimes leading in academia is like leading a volunteer organization because I have tenured faculty that I can't fire unless it's under extreme circumstances. I think in the real world, sometimes it's a little easier to deal with a problem employee because you can say, you know, you can document and then giving um, formative coaching and then eventually having an evaluation that's summative and saying, okay, you're not meeting the goals. But for those of us who can't do that, particularly in academia, it has been difficult. I don't have, I, I'd like to think right now, I guess maybe I'm still naive enough to think that it, we can't give up, that we still should keep trying to, to solve the problems. I see that it's 201, Angela. I'm sorry that I went a little longer on my presentation maybe and didn't allow for as many questions. That's perfectly fine, Lily. And thank you everyone for attending today's webinar and Lily for presenting such an engaging session. You gave us a lot of things to think about and it's such valuable information. Please be sure to check out the membership options and benefits. Oops, my, give me, there we are. <laughs> Please be sure to check out the membership options and benefits at avs.org under the membership tab, which includes registration discounts and technical webinars, as well as announcements on upcoming events and access to the technical publications and libraries. And please remember to complete the survey. Your feedback is important to us and it is certainly appreciated. Thank you once again for everyone for joining us. Thank you.